Thank you for calling PSA, Professional Sports Authenticator. All calls will be recorded for quality or training purposes. For customer service, please press 2. For set registry, please press La 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 baseball cards. It's Cardcast with Mike and Lens, the show about everything sports cards, autographs, and memorabilia. I'm Len Plus C, and I'm here with my friend and co-host Mike T. Mike, what's uh, what's cooking in Brooklyn? Hey, what's up, Len? How are you? I'm good. It sounds like a Spike Lee joint. New movie. Yeah, yeah. I'll take it. So uh, so it's been a little while since we did our last one. We uh, Our episode five was with Jimmy Spence. It was, uh, Jesus, three weeks ago, four weeks ago now. So we apologize to the fans. We had a lot going on. You know, I was in the middle of buying a house that I didn't get, so that's awesome. And, uh, you know, Mike's been busy doing uh, fatherly things, husbandly things. And, yeah. uh, you know, and things have been jamming in the, um, in the opening day room, uh, the opening day break room and tell us some, uh, tell us about some of the, uh, the fantastic hits you've been getting out of there, uh, recently. Uh, uh, wow. I'm going to condense it. I'll try to make it as, uh, as you know, it, there's so many good things we've been, uh, we've been breaking a lot of stuff, a lot of different products, uh, 2016 Panini Pantheon. Uh, we broke that. And again, we keep things really cheap. It's a couple of dollars a spot. Someone actually hit a quad jersey. Uh, it's, a, it's actually three jerseys and a piece of bat. It's called, uh, it's like Monumental Moments or something along those lines. It's four players that have some sort of connection, usually the same team. And this one had uh, Lou Brock, Stan Musial, Bob Gibson and Rogers Hornsby, and it, it was a one of one. It's an absolutely beautiful card. I saw that break, and if my memory serves me correctly, because that was like I don't know, probably a couple of weeks ago now. But um, I think it's a, it's a, it's the insert is called Rushmore. It, it looks like Mount Rushmore. It's it's like um, it's something moments. I'm not exactly sure, but it is like it's a, basically Mount Rushmore in the background, kind of. And they give a, the four the picture of the four players. It's really really cool. To the people that don't Definitely, really, yeah. to the people that don't know, um, you know, I don't know modern sports of cards or or even you know collecting, I don't know favorite players of your team or or whatever. There's there's a phrase that's out there like, "What's your rush more for for basketball? Who's the four top guys?" And people do that with their teams, and they also do that, uh, you know just in general for sports like if basketball was you know michael jordan larry bird magic johnson and julius irving that's my rushmore you know what i mean right yeah and panini took it to a new level by actually putting the players basically on a mount rushmore which is very very cool that was just uh, one of the hits we've we've been breaking uh some vintage we pulled a 55 bowman mickey mantle a 55 tops jackie robinson I mean, we've been pulling absolute fire. It's been a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, from newer products, we hit a one-of-one one Steve Carlton, Topps Archives. Uh, we hit one of our biggest hits ever in the room was a Derek Jeter um, 
Luminaries, Tops Luminaries 2017 autographed on card auto out of five. Um, Reggie Jackson on card autograph four jersey out of 15. Just some really fun stuff. And then to, to be even more different, uh, recently we've done a couple of guitars. So I do, uh, they, you can do breaks for guitars, signed guitars. So on a dollar spot, someone won a signed guitar from a, a band member of the band Sticks. And then just the other day, someone won a, uh, on a dollar spot, a signed Fallout Boys, uh, guitar signed by one of the members of Fallout Boys. So that's also very cool. Again, I mix it up. I have all different types of things. I have, uh, so another thing we got was a signed script, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, signed by Batista, the, uh, the wrestler. So I went to a wrestling fan too, which made me really happy. So we did some really cool things. Another one was a, uh, a Scarface, a Scarface script signed by Stephen Bauer, who I actually have a personal connection to. I, uh, I played rock band with Stephen Bauer about 15 years ago at a house party. So just a uh, little tidbits there, but it was uh, very cool, very cool items coming out for sure. Um, and always things always break in every day. A uh, lot of, lot of fun stuff, just different fun stuff. You're not going to see in any other rooms. I forgot uh, that, that I, I forgot that that was like a really big, uh, you know, like guitar hero and rock band like that. That was the <laughs> thing to do for a couple of years without a doubt. <laughs> It was. It's funny. It was my, my wife, my, my wife and I weren't even married yet. And her best friend, uh, was dating a guy who was good friends with Stephen Bauer. And we were, we were all at his, uh, at this guy's apartment and Stephen Bauer was there. And I think if you look on my Facebook, you'll actually see back in the day, there's a picture of me and Stephen Bauer playing rock band together. So it was pretty cool. It's, uh, uh but- it, it was also pretty funny to see like how, like how ridiculously good people got and how serious they took it oh <laughs> between that and and revolution i mean there was a whole uh there was a whole south park about uh like a, a dance troupe and stuff and there was this one kid who was really good at dance dance revolution i mean it's just that was a that was a big thing i don't even know what 10 12 15 years ago all that kind of stuff it was it was yeah, yeah. Big, I gotta, I gotta numbers. give, I gotta give a quick shout out to one of our listeners who's texting me. I gotta, I gotta text him back while we're doing this. But uh, his name is Jeremy Barnes. He used to set up at my shows uh, in Stratford. I've known him for a long time, and um, he was inquiring on the uh, the eighty six, eighty seven Flair Jordan uh, that I'd recently sold, and asked me if I was happy. And I'm like, Yep, I'm happy. <laughs> so uh, shout out to shout out to Jeremy Barnes. Thanks for listening to the show, and uh, stop bothering me right now. We're trying to record this thing. Well, you know what? It was a, it's a great segue into all the things Lenny has done recently. Talk, why don't you talk a little bit about what's going on with uh, eBay or all the stuff that you've been uh, doing on on eBay? Well, yeah. So it's it's on it's on and off of eBay. Um, you know, basically, uh, just the other night, I had uh, I don't know, probably seventy to eighty auctions go off. It was probably closer to ninety auctions, and. Um, not everything open, but probably 60% of everything opened and got bids and, and, and stuff like that. But the, uh, you know, the anchor was the 86, 87, four, 86, 87 flare PSA seven, uh, Michael Jordan, which is kind of cool because it, that kind of came along as we just started doing the podcast. I, you know, I got it out of a deal. I have it actually, I have the picture raw on episode one. So if you go back and just look at episode one, uh, on our YouTube channel, you can see the picture of the card without it being in a holder. Uh, I sent it in. It was there was major delays, uh, even though I paid a premium or like the very quick service, which is called Express. It took a while for them to get it, but it actually worked out in my favor because while that was going on, they released the the docu series, The Last Dance, ten episodes, Michael Jordan and his and his Bulls with the you know with their championship runs there, and that just created. And something that's still going on, even as of last night, as I'm watching some some of my auctions go off, but just an unbelievable frenzy for Michael Jordan stuff. And the prices have just skyrocketed. It's something I haven't seen. I haven't seen anything like this ever. You know, I, you heard about things going up crazy in the, you know, in the in the mid to late 80s. But this is like, it's pretty cool to see. And uh, yeah, I feel like this is unprecedented with the, with the Jordans. This is absolutely crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, even you know, so the uh, when I when I sent the Jordan in originally, I only had it insured for eighteen hundred dollars because that's at the time that's about what it was worth, and it actually ended on auction uh, on Monday and it sold for just you know just under thirty eight hundred dollars. So I, that's that's a that's a nice jump, um, you know, and it's kind of cool to. To experience something like that, because usually I'm very like business as usual. There's always a market for something. You buy behind a little bit, a little bit behind the market, and then you sell it. And if you don't have that, and it doesn't go up like that, and you're all, always selling stuff, you know, you never really get a chance to to experience the the nice, the the real nice profit margin. So, um, so that was cool. Uh, and then even like last night, I had six 1991 Upper Deck SP1 Jordans in a lot that I was watching. You know, I started off at nine nine ninety nine. I couldn't believe what they were going for, that they were around twenty five dollars a piece. And the six cards ended last night at around two hundred and ten dollars, which I'm I'm floored. I'm floored. Now the guy hasn't paid me yet, but but the guy's got high feedback, so we'll see. I mean, I, I, like that to me. Uh, three weeks ago, five weeks ago, that's a dollar to a three dollar card all day long. And I'm not bashing what's, you know, that it shouldn't be that much, but I'm just in awe that stuff is actually getting those kind of prices. And it's, it's kind of nice to see. It is. You know what? The, I, I'm noticing the, the junk era, you know, quote unquote junk era is the, uh, is getting the respect. I feel like it deserves. I'm not sure 1988 Donruss will ever get there, but I'm seeing tons of stuff. 1990 tops. Everybody's still looking for that. Frank Thomas, uh, no name. I'm starting to see, oh man, uh, McGuire, Sosa, uh, big, you know, bigger names from the nineties and, and, you know, guys who were rookies in 1990, 89, 88, all these cards are going up. It's, it's unbelievable. And I'm sure it has to do number one with nostalgia. Number two with, uh, you know, again, we're, we're older now. We can afford these type of cards, Ken Griffey Jr. And also the COVID, everybody's home. You know, what else is there to do? I, I find myself buying random stuff. I uh, I just bought a, uh, I think I was telling you, I bought a Pac-Man uh, video game system, like an actual, like the arcade one-up. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's um, they were sold at Walmart. I, they're distributed pretty much, they're all over the place now. But it's, it's basically, it looks like a full-size uh, video game machine. Just because uh, I'm like, hey, well, my kids like Pac-Man, why not? Do I need it? No, but we're just buying things to buy things at this point. Well, so, what's what's, yeah. more, what's more nostalgic than Pac Man? I mean, Pac Man. I mean, to <laughs> us, for guys that are our age, you know. I mean, and then it also. I mean, your kids love it, so that it's just like it now. Pac Man is ingrained uh, as a pop culture iconic cartoon video game. Well, it's funny though. The reason they got into it is because of my break room. Um, I, I've one of the things I do is opening day pop culture and I put a bunch of stuff in a big box and then I, I break the box and people get to choose, they get to draft. And one of the items that I had purchased before I put it in the box was a miniature Pac-Man game. It looks just like a video arcade. It's probably scaled, I don't know, one fiftieth. I, I have no idea the scale size, but my girls are like, Oh, we want to play this. I said, it's not for you. And then they talked me into being for them. So now they play Pac-Man all the time on that. So sorry, guys. Who that was one of the things that was going to be in the uh, the pop culture break, but now my kids have it. Well, so and, and you know what? And your kids are awesome. And I see that they're uh, helping out on some of the. I saw them on I think on a couple of the guitar breaks. So um, yeah, they, they love helping me out. As a matter of fact, yesterday they were uh, de sleeving 1989 Fleer cards for me. Uh, I took the Griffey out. I took the Johnson out and the Ripken. And I let them go nuts and they were in nine pocket sleeves and they, they like putting them in boxes for me and then, you know, pretend selling them to me. So they, they help me. They, you know, it's a, it's actually a real help because you, you know what it's like to take, you know, sets out of, uh, out of those nine pocket sleeves. I need, I need to have a couple of kids just to put cards in number order. Like that's, that's really? what I need to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I'll send mine over your way. Yeah. And, uh, shout- a nice- Shout out to Ava and Savannah who does a really, really good job with helping out the breaks. Hi, girls. They they're wonderful, and Ava's eight and Savannah's four, and they they love helping Daddy out. So it's it's actually really wonderful. That's awesome. Hey, I want to go back to um, the 
like part of the reason why we're seeing the boom in just pretty much everything junk air or just anything that's good. And uh, so I think, like you said, there, there, there's a perfect storm right now where there is not really any sports being played. People are at home. You know, they're kind of forced to be at home or, or they're choosing to stay at home. Uh, right now it's uh, May 21st. So there's, a you know, there, there's states that are, all the states are pretty much slowly opening up. And uh, so, which is going to be horrible for the hobby because now people are going to be distracted with things like work. Uh, but uh, basically, you know, with this whole time being at home, I think there was a reflection. There was a nostalgia thing. You couldn't really get distracted with watching current sports. So, you know, you might've, gone on YouTube and maybe watched some old games and you kind of started seeing, um, you know, like, well, yeah, I, you know, I used to collect cards and this and that. And I really feel like it took like an extra, see the, one of the things that I remember growing up was there was like, and I don't, you, you can agree with me, you can disagree with me. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people that are going to agree with me, but the, it felt like there was a magic number called 20 years. Okay. So like if you had cards from 88 or 89 or 90, you were guided by like maybe your grandfather or father or whoever you collected with. The older people were like, just wait 20 years and, and the cards will be, the, the cards will be valuable. So protect your cards and wait 20 years. Well, what happened was, is they waited 20 years. So a card that was an 89 in 2009, just, it was worth nothing. It was worth less than nothing. People were throwing those cards away because they were so overproduced. Um, and what happened in, in, a, in a bad way in a perfect storm back in 2008, when you had the economy start to crash, the top baseball players like Barry Bonds, McGuire, and they were all labeled as cheaters. So people were like, I don't want to collect cheaters. When all that stuff was coming out and, and being dumped, people realized that there was mo way more supply than demand. So now you have people that are going to try to sell their stuff because they're losing their jobs during this, you know, depression that we're having or recession and um, they're not getting anything for it. You know, I mean, I would get phone calls back from, you know, 2008 to 2012. And if they just said they, they, they had kind of already knew they were like, yeah, I just have eighties and nineties. Like I, I, I couldn't even go and buy the stuff because nobody was, nobody was buying it. Nobody, nobody, there was nobody to sell it to. There yeah. was still a card market, but, you know, people were like, well, no, I mean, Mike Schmidt rookies are 50 bucks now, so I'll buy a Mike Schmidt rookie, which means now you got to go to somebody's house and offer them 30 for it <laughs> for their Mike Schmidt rookie. Now, now that's a totally different case because, they're, you know, even the worst condition Mike Schmidt rookies sell for 40 to $50 that are in really bad shape. But there was a perfect storm for everything to kind of turn bad. And now we're in like a perfect storm. If there's a bright spot out of this whole COVID-19 is that the the sports card and memorabilia industry really is is pumping. And, and, I, and again, I'm horrible at predicting things. I was like, no, people are losing their jobs. They're going to they're going to they're going to try to everybody's going to try to sell. And there's not going to be enough people to back it up, whereas the opposite happened. And it just goes to show you how powerful nostalgia really is. And that is, that is, you know, the, the fact that, you know, people are, they're at home, they're not spending money on vacations. They're not, you know, going to birthday parties. Like you have two kids, you know, you're not going to other people's birthday parties. So, you know, and you know, you got to bring that 20 to $50 gift or however, whatever, um, keeping up with the Joneses, <laughs> you know, scenario that you're in there, there's there just now it's like, if anything, it's a drive by or, you know, a, a zoom call or something like that. And that's really it, you know? So there's, so even though you might be, you know, collecting unemployment or you still might be at home working, there's, there's a little bit of disposable income to go towards this stuff. And it's really, really spiked the hobby. Yeah. And you mentioned, um, and, and this is something I just thought about, as you mentioned, the power of nostalgia, so you're talking about us being kids in the 80s and 90s and 30 years later, us having disposable income and a lot of us having children who might want to get into the hobby. So think about this. When was the, uh, the, the, the first boom of baseball cards? We're talking about the 80s, right? When we were kids. Well, what about where's the nostalgia there? How about our parents who collected cards as kids in the 50s? So their 30 year, you know, turnaround. And all of a sudden they're having kids and hey, let's collect baseball cards. And that's, you know, that kind of makes me think that that's kind of how it started. You know, the nostalgia of, oh, my parents threw away my cards. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to get those cards, but you know what? 
I'll collect with my son, my daughter, my nephew, and we'll collect cards now in the eighties. And then for them in, in 20, 30 years, you know, they'll see, they'll, they'll feel like I feel now. So I feel like that the power of nostalgia is such a big deal. I mean, I get it when it's funny, totally off topic. When, uh, when a woman wears a perfume that like an ex girlfriend wore, it's like, it brings you back in an instant. A careful, smell, what you, uh, careful what you say, careful what you say, you Mike, know, and being recorded. <laughs> yeah. My wife doesn't listen to the podcast most of the time. She's, I, I had her listen to the first one and she's just, she's not a baseball card fan or anything like that. She's not even a sports fan. So she's not good, but it's the truth. And she'll know it. I, I tell her, you know, we have a good relationship like that, but it, it's true. So the power of nostalgia is it, you, you can't quantify it for sure. Well, speaking of the power of nostalgia, we have uh, something that we've been wanting to talk about for a while, and that was the uh, the 2020 Basketball Hall of Fame. The big three, the big three names that are going in are Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, and Kevin Garnett. And, you know, talk about bringing me back to, you know, my mid to late teens. I mean, these are the guys that, you know, I saw come out, you know, roughly in within, you know, three to four years of each other. And the fact that they're all going in together is, is pretty fantastic. Mike, what can you tell us a little bit uh, about Kevin Garnett? Oh, man. Uh, uh, well, he was uh, one of four players in NBA history to win an MVP and a Defensive Player of the Year, which is impressive by itself. But, I mean, talk about starting off uh, in high school. First of all, he went from high school straight to the pros. Uh, he was a 95 McDonald's All-American High School Player of the Year. But even before that, one of the things uh, I I was shocked to read was that he had to leave his high school after he was arrested for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, it's funny because we just we talked about that today with uh, something different. But being in the wrong place at the wrong time, um, he was arrested for lynching, second-degree lynching, which basically he was – a bunch of his friends were chasing some guy – it was, but he he wasn't involved at all, and he was absolved of of any of the uh, the misdoings. But his parents were so scared of any kind of backlash or something, they sent him to live with his sister. His sister being older, and uh, he moved in with his sister for his senior year in Chicago, and that's where he became this great player. So I thought that was really interesting. Also, he was the first player drafted out of high school since 1975. So there was a uh, a 20 year, I guess, more, more moratorium, moratorium. I can't say that, um, where you couldn't, uh, you had to play in college before you could go to the pros. And, uh, they took that off and Garnett was actually drafted by the Minnesota Timberwolves. So I thought that was, um, you know, he was, he was, um, basically led the path for everybody else, the Kobe's and the LeBron's and all those guys coming out of high school. Um, yeah, I think that, we, um, and, and I just want to go back to the, uh, you know, what you said before as far as Garnett getting in trouble. I mean, it sounds exactly like what happened with Allen Iverson. I mean, there was some sort of uh, shooting, I think, in a club. Uh, and, you know, he... I remember that. Yeah, he had to go through, you know, he had to go through hell. He didn't have anything really to do with it, but he was there. So I guess the lesson is to, you know, all the parents out there is really just pay attention to who your kids are, are hanging out with because, you know... It's, uh, yeah. you know, I, you I see who you hang out. With. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. Like I've seen, um, there's a, there's a guy who finished, he actually finished his uh, career with St. John's, uh, his basketball career, Mustafa Haran. He, he actually went to Sega Hart here in Connecticut. And, you know, unfortunately he finished out on a bad note. I think he was injured, um, before the COVID even happened. So the season ended and, um, you know, his college career is done, but, you know, he was going into college as being one of those game changing players. And I saw the people who he, uh, uh, you know, aligned him with. And those people were like, you know, very, very protective and, you know, just w didn't, they didn't want to have, they didn't want him to have any kind of blemishes or anything like that. Plus, I mean, the kid had, he had a really good head on his shoulders, so still does. So um, if he doesn't happen to get pro tryouts, uh, because of his efficiency, I really wish him well, um, you know, overseas, because I'm sure that's probably where he's going to take his talents. And being a uh, Red Storm fan, I got to see him in person. I take uh, me and Ava go with uh, one of her friends and her friend's dad. We go to St. John's games every year. So we got to see him uh, up close. Yeah, so I it, feel, it was cool. I, yeah, I feel like he had, he had um, 
you know, he was like he just missed that one season where it just he was able to explode. He, he I mean, if you look at his his shooting, his percentage for shooting for his whole college career, it's pretty crazy. He was very very efficient. Um, yeah, really you know, good player. Which which allowed other players, you know, to kind of you know open up. But anyway, so back to Garnett. Mustafa didn't get in the Hall of Fame. Love him, but <laughs> Garnett's in. Yeah, maybe 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 in twenty forty. Uh, yeah, no, just a uh, fifteen time All Star. Uh, trying to look here. Uh, just a really, really great player. He uh, he played for Minnesota for a bunch of years, and then there were some problems. Uh, he was upset with, uh, if you guys remember another New York product, uh, Stephon Marbury. He was very upset when they traded Marbury. They were, you know, they were kind of like a dynamic duo. And then uh, another St. John's guy, uh, he Malik Sealy passed away. That was like part of their core. One of my favorites. There were a lot of, yeah, I was very, yeah. I was very sad. I was really sad when when Malik Sealy passed away because I I was really on that Garnett train. Like you know, I I loved the Knicks growing up, but you know, watching Garnett, I was like, how could you not like this guy? And then yeah. you know, you would see those 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 core people there, and I knew that him and Malik Sealy were really really close. And um, you know, it was it was sad when when I heard him pass, and it wasn't it wasn't even his fault. He got I think I think Malik Sealy got hit by a drunk driver, and he was sober. And unbelievable, and uh, I do remember a uh, Malik Sealy story. If I, mean, I, I'm pretty sure this is true. Uh, they were they stopped off in a they were in an airport or something, and he had to go to the bathroom. And he went to the bathroom, and he left a playbook in the bathroom, and somebody else found it. It's like a whole big thing, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't know. It, it, that sticks out in my mind for some reason. Maybe because he was a St. John's guy. I'm like, ah, oh, how could he do that? But uh, I, I was always a fan. Always a fan of Malik Sealy. Yeah. Uh, so with the problems in Minnesota, then he uh, he really wanted out. So they ended up doing what ended up being the most, I, I, wouldn't, I don't know how to explain it, lopsided in terms of players. It was the biggest something for one trade in the history of the NBA with seven players for one player, Kevin Garnett. So seven players went from uh, Boston to to Minnesota, and Garnett went to Boston, and he eventually led them to uh, a title in 2007. So... It's kind of One funny. Of it's things. like it's kind of funny. It's like here, here's here's our whole team. Here's a here's a starting. I mean, Paul, I know Paul Pierce didn't go, but like here's here's a start. Here's a whole team for your for your big ticket. We'll take your big ticket. Yeah, and you know what? I didn't look it up, but I'm sure some of them were draft picks. But still, it, it doesn't matter. It's uh, seven for one. I'm, I'm pretty. pretty I'm pretty great. sure. Last time I checked, there's only five guys on on, on the floor at a time. So seven yeah. seven's a lot. Yeah. Well, you have to build a team, right? And I'm sure, like, a couple of those guys might have been, like, cap casual, you know, guys that just help for cap reasons, and then they were cut. I didn't, you know, I didn't do a deep dive into the exact trade and, and why guys were traded. But in the NBA, a lot of guys get traded and then um, get cut just for salary cap purposes so that they could use the money for the following year or something like that. So that, that could have been the case as well. But also, Garnett is one of only three players with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Carl Malone to have 25,000 points, 14,000 rebounds, and 5,000 assists. So you talk about a, a big man, and we talked about this. Uh, he could run the floor. He was he was the first. He basically created that that slash forward position because he could do everything. So it was, uh, it was good to see that type of player because that's really what the NBA has become now. You know, no more plotting big men. It was really, you know, those slashy type guys who could dribble, handle the ball if they needed to take it up the court. And he wasn't playing, you know, too much. He was playing back to the basket, but he was able to to make some moves to the basket, which uh, we really hadn't seen before from a, a big man. So that was uh, that was interesting, also. Yeah, the athletic big man, that uh, Shaq, as big as he was and as athletic as he was. I mean, you, you, that combination is is lethal. But to have that that taller, you know, thin, um, you know, muscular uh, center. You know, center slash forward. I mean, he was really a center, and in defense, I mean, he was he was just a monster. But on offense, I mean, to be able to handle the ball, you know, I feel like it kind of like it was a, there was a little bit of makings of that with Ralph Sampson, who was seven foot four, who could actually handle the ball full length of the court, um, tall, thin, wiry guy. Uh, but he got injured a lot, and and Garnett didn't. The way the NBA went. Like you said, getting rid of the plotting big man who's just going to sit down and camp down at the post and you know put up a hook shot or kick it in and out. I mean, that just no. It's just that he he really uh, he re- he really uh, 
you know, created that almost like a, a whole new position. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, now thinking about his cards, he's got, uh, his best card is a 95, 96, uh, finest. And I was looking that up and you know, he doesn't, he doesn't get a lot. I mean, listen, in a PSA 10, there's still about a thousand dollars, but I feel like, you know, he doesn't get that love. And I don't know if it's because he doesn't really have a huge fan base. When he came up, he did. He went to Minnesota. He had a fan base. Then he went to, you know, he went to the Celtics. He won a title, but he's not really, I don't know. Do you consider him a Celtic? Then he went to the, the Nets, I believe, when they were in New Jersey. So I, I don't know if he's got a home. He's kind of like that that Phil Negro, Gaylord Perry on a much better scale. But he's one of those guys that doesn't really have a, a home team. Kobe Bryant is a Laker. Tim Duncan is a Spur. Garnett, I don't know. Well, I'm not my, in, in my opinion because I, obviously I'm I'm really high on basketball. I mean, I just I look at him I look at him as a Timberwolf and a Celtic. I mean, I I don't really count the 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 twilight years if you're a journeyman. Okay. Just like I I would look at like Vince Carter, I would look at him as a Raptor and a Net. And then everything after that is I you know all the all the whatever ten teams that he played for the Hawks, the Nets, the Spurs, whatever Mavericks. Hey, I think he's still playing, isn't he? He, I think, I think he's done. I, I think this was supposed to be his last year, but he he touched oh, okay. he touched four decades of basketball. So you know, nineties, early two thousands, you know, the two thousand teens, and then two thousand and twenties. So that we could talk about him in the twenty twenty five uh, class. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's definitely getting in. But that, but that's how we look at Vince Carter. Vince Carter's a Raptor because I feel like that was you know he spent a good amount of time there it was when he first you know Vince Sanity was was born. And then, you know, and then his run with the Nets. But then after that, you know, it's just, it's, it's journeymen, but that those, those are the two teams I would put, you know, Vince Carter with. So I don't know. I mean, I would assume that he would go in. I mean, he's going to go in either as a Raptor or a net uh, for, for Vince Carter. And, and as far as, uh, well, I don't know. Do they do that in basketball? I don't even know. Do they, do they actually well, like assign know. a team? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how that works. That's, that's something to look into, but there's no hat. So it's a little different than baseball. So I don't know how it would work, well, but I, think, I mean, yeah, I, I don't. For- I'm pretty sure now that I'm thinking about it, you don't really affiliate yourself with a team like like the you know in baseball. That's like a big reveal if you played for multiple teams. Like uh, Musina, was, was he going to go in as an Oriole or was he going to go in a, as a Yankee? And I think he went in as a right. a Yankee, right? You know what? I'm not sure. I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I feel like he might have gone in with no hat. Right, right, right. I'm not sure, but yeah, guys do that. Uh, I want to say, like, at some point there was a choice. I don't know if they have a choice now. I, I, the Baseball Hall of Fame, they, they've mixed it up over the years, so I'm not so sure. So we'll see. But either way, he was a, uh, a great player for a number of teams. And you can actually still get some of his rookie cards ungraded for a couple of bucks. Which yeah, is amazing. And, and, the, and there's and you know and the, his his cards were when he came up as a rookie. That's when the card companies really. I felt were becoming to be at their best where they were really, you know, they were focusing on inserts. They were focusing. It was almost like a lottery. Like they would, you know, they say, okay, you know, this insert set is one out of 12 packs. Well, this one's one out of 24. This one's one out of 72. Then you start getting like one per case, one per, and, and the, it felt like the harder the insert, the better it looked and the more attractive it was, which caused a frenzy to uh, open up as many packs as you could get. And the benefit of that was, you know, getting, um, you know, a lot of cool, you know, base cards or lower end inserts of, of, of these superstars. But I really felt that co- the companies were in their prime as far as coming out with fresh ideas for insert cards, parallel cards. And the one thing that I really feel that would have probably changed a little bit as far as the perception of Kevin Garnett and his rookie cards is like, yeah, he's got his finest card, which is an upper echelon product, but they didn't do a refractor parallel like they did with the following year with 96, 97, and it's Kobe Bryant, Allen Iverson rookie year, Ray Allen. I mean, a loaded, loaded draft class. Um, and then, of course, with Kobe, it's you know, 96, 97 tops chrome. But I feel like it was just at the tip of that. And then as, you know, Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, Vince Carter, and those guys are coming through, you know, everybody's got some great, great rookie cards. And also the the insert cards were fantastic. And don't forget Jordan's hide. He's, he's buried in all that stuff too, as far as the tougher to get insert cards. And those, the, the, even I'm looking at stuff the other day and, you know, just like a card that I would have hoped to get to have gotten $5 at a show are now selling for, 
you know, thirty to forty dollars on eBay. It's 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 insane. It's impressive. It's unbelievable. It, it's great. It's great for the hobby. Uh, you know, and what's funny is. One of my friends had sent me something. ESPN is writing articles about this kind of stuff. So this is like this is hitting mainstream. So people are recognizing it not only in the industry but also in the uh, in the world. They're seeing they're seeing the, the the price you know the prices of things going up. The the thing with the Jordan and all the different. The, another thing that we really haven't touched on and totally off topic with the basketball players is that the Sosa and the Maguire stuff is going up because it's supposed to be an ESPN 30 for 30 on Sammy Sosa. So people are like clamoring to get Sosa Maguire stuff, the 1998, all that stuff. So, you know, you're seeing things go up and you know, then there are the little things that go up because of that. The the Griffey stuff, his upper deck stuff has gone up like crazy. So again, it's, it's all about, you know, perception in the industry and maybe Kevin Garnett stuff will go up at some point too. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe he's an amazing hall of fame speech and people are, if, if we have a hall of fame speech this year, I don't even know if that's going to happen. And, um, who knows, who knows, but you know, I, I feel like his base rookie card should still not be a dollar though. My personal opinion. No, no. And especially too, since that stuff is now it's, you know, it's 25 years old. So, um, exactly. You know, and you know, it's funny cause last night, I'm literally getting a bunch of vintage lots ready to go up on auction on eBay. I'm basically liquidating my uh, my bargain box inventory, and I'm just you know get getting stuff in in nice, priceable lots, and just they're, I'm going to have probably a couple hundred, uh, you know, '60s, '70s baseball, uh, you know, minor stars, stars, Hall of Famers um, that you just can't sell individually. So I'm taking photographs, I'm lotting them up, and in the background, I'm just again nostalgia I'm, i had on on youtube i had uh you know when it was a game two i believe which was uh pretty much mostly uh 50s baseball love when it was game three because i had 60s baseball but right after that uh i actually yes i think it might have been espn they put out it like an hour long you know basically like where they followed mcguire and sosa for the whole whole year in 98 and you see a young skip bayless being interviewed and uh i mean that year was so awesome for baseball. And, uh, I mean, just watching that, I mean, you don't, you don't even have to wait for the 30 for 30. You can actually go back and just watch that. Cause they did a really good job of documenting all that. And then they put it together in about an hour, uh, you know, our show where, you know, you literally watch it from the beginning, you know, to, to the end. And, uh, you know, as far as who was involved in the home run chase, like it just wasn't McGuire and Sosa and, and Sosa actually came on very late. He had a monster June, uh, where I think he had 20 home runs in June. And that's what got him caught up because, uh, McGuire and Griffey were really going ahead to head. And so was, uh, Vinny Castilla. So it was a, it just, it just brought me right back. And like, I not even realizing I forgot about Castilla, you know, um, you know, and Griffey, I, Griffey was in the, I think, in the high 50s that year uh, as well. So it was just really cool to see the back and forth. And um, I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but, you know, McGuire wins <laughs> the home run what? chase. Yeah, I know. I know. But actually, one of the things I forgot about was that he actually hit the 70th home run on his last at bat of the season. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that, which I thought was pretty cool. Like, so, I mean, if you get a chance, I mean, maybe I'll just put the link in the bottom, you know, for the uh, – for the people that want to check that out, because uh, it's 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 just nostalgia brings you right back. Doesn't matter to me. It it kind of throw the whole, especially with those guys, like throw the cheating out the window. I mean, they didn't. It's you know, MLB knew it was going on. They turned their heads. But the thing about it is, and I, one of the reasons why McGuire gets like kind of dumped on is for the you know for the lying factor. I mean, the guy busted his yeah. butt. You know, like he busted his butt to get as big and, you know, practice and whatever. He still got to hit the ball. Yes, he was hitting moonshots like every single time. But, you know, you he he worked his butt off. So, he really you, know, did. you know, so I mean, I so I could see why he was being defensive and almost like, yeah, like, no, this is this is I'm just, you know, this is natural, which it, it wasn't. But, I you know, I mean, yeah, you could do all the steroids in the world and not be that good. So, I mean, these guys were still good ball players no matter what. The Bonds, the Sosas, the Maguires. Yes, the, the, you know, the steroids helped, obviously. But there were, there were plenty, I'm sure there were plenty of guys in the minors who never made it, who took steroids. If you're not good, you're not good. That's just the way it is. Right. I mean, there were, there were, there were guys that were, you know, that were, you know, quote unquote juicing and, 
you know, the, their best seasons, might they might have had 20 or 25 home runs. I mean, I look at, you know, a guy like Mike Cameron, who was on the Mitchell Report and was technically one of the best center fielders for, for a little while. He was like a top three or top five center fielder. And he did what he did, and he was only able to produce like a 285 batting average and 25 or 30 home runs. Like, so... No, yeah, you, you still have to be you still have to be a good ball player, and that's the that's the people's cases with Barry Bonds making the Hall of Fame, Roger Clemens making the Hall of Fame. These guys were good without it, so you know it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. You know, but I could see how people say, "Oh well, Bonds deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. He was a Hall of Famer. He was on a Hall of Fame trajectory anyway before all this stuff happened. He just became like superhuman when it did." So it, it enhances you, but you're still the player you are. You still have to hit the ball. You still have to hit the curveball. You still have to, you know, not swing at a, a bad pitch. It, it's still hard. It's baseball. It's the hardest thing to do. I know. It's amazing. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, yeah, you have to do it. And it's fun. And it was fun to watch, <laughs> I mean, how far McGuire it looked like he was swinging a toothpick, you know? Yes. It's just it, and he just and he, him and Sosa were just launching stuff, you know, in in you know either in the upper decks or out of the stadiums. It was just really cool to see to go back. I, I strongly suggest if if you're not doing anything, go back and just watch that to start, and then get ready for the thirty for thirty. So, yeah. but speaking of Tim Duncan, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, what are we to- speaking of sidetracks, yeah, Tim always gets overlooked. Yeah, That's I know. It's Tim, Duncan Tim Duncan with his seventy-five home run. No, Tim Duncan. Uh, he gets in. He, you know, he grew up in St. Which I, I didn't realize this, but he didn't. He didn't start playing basketball until ninth grade. He grew up in uh, St. Croix in the Virgin Islands, and their only pool. He was a swimmer, and that's what he was gearing up to be. I don't know if he was going to go to the Olympics or whatever. Apparently, he was a prominent swimmer. And I guess Hurricane Hugo back in the nineties, uh, early nineties, did you know destroyed the only pool that the Virgin Islands had for him to train in. So he got into basketball and at ninth grade and uh, his stat line, I mean, he, you know, he went to Wake Forest where he, you saw him. I remember watching him play and I remember him getting dominated by a guy who was in the 96, 97 draft. He went to the Raptors and his name is Marcus Camby. Marcus Camby went to UMass and I, he just, he owned Tim Duncan and you saw, you know, the, the growth in the learning process. I mean, Tim Duncan was still getting used to a seven foot frame or six eleven frame. He was a power forward. He wasn't, he was athletic enough. He wasn't like a, a Kevin Garnett, but he was, he was athletic enough. He had a good basketball mind. From my understanding, he was like a sponge. He just kind of took everything in. And then finally, when his body, you know, was completely developed, you know, he was able to kind of unleash in, into the NBA and uh, where he became a five-time champion. He was the 1997-98 number one pick. He was a three-time NBA Finals MVP, a two-time league MVP, and he was also a 15-time All-Star. Uh, he was also 10-time All-NBA first team. And when you talk about points, rebounds, and clutch, even though Tim Duncan was surrounded by some really good teams, you know, his whole career, like he had good players around him, but the team was really focused. It, it was, it, it was focused around him. Oh, absolutely. Um, what a, first of all, what, what a, just an unsung hero. Uh, you had mentioned that he was, uh, he was swimming, trying to go to the Olympics. One of his sisters was actually, she actually swam for the U S Virgin islands in, uh, in 1988 in the Olympics, which I thought was very impressive just coming from that family. And one of the things I, I always thought about with him is, you know, he, he stayed in college, so he wasn't one of those guys that, that left early, and apparently he he made a promise. His mom was dying, and he made a promise that he would get his college degree. So that was um, that's a really, you know, touching story where he stayed in college, and, you, you know, everybody's like, oh, why is this guy staying in college? Well, listen, he made a, he made a promise to his uh, dying mom. Yeah, and he was, he. I mean, you couldn't say anything bad about that guy. He didn't, like, mouth off. He didn't, you know he wasn't getting into trouble and actually when he decided to retire it was just like he just let the spurs know that he was retiring and that was it he didn't have a press conference like other guys and you know just basically just said okay i'm you know i'm done whereas you know some other guys are like yep i gotta have a press conference because i need the world i need to let the world know that i'm retiring he was like no i'm walking away yeah i I like that about him it's just different you know And and it seems fitting for him oh absolutely and, you know, his so 
again, getting into that late 90s basketball stuff, his 97, 98 tops chrome refractor is, is I mean, through the roof. Uh, it's, you know, hundreds to thousands of dollars for, and, you know, any grade. Uh, wasn't, it definitely was not an easy card to, to get. Uh, and people, that was the first year that tops chrome for basketball was actually obtainable because in 96, 97, they were just retail packs in Walmart. And that was it. So that's why the Kobe Chrome, just the base Chrome, not even the refractor, is just you know through the roof. And so when, because it went over so well, even though all t- all Chrome is is just a parallel of the regular tops issue, just the cards look chromed out. When they released it in ninety seven ninety eight, it just I mean they almost couldn't make enough of it. But the refractor, I remember. Bo- I remember busting boxes and getting. I felt like I got one Tim Duncan rookie in every in every box. I did not hit a refractor of Tim Duncan, um, but I did hit guys like Allen Iverson and Ray. I was getting like the second year guys. I would get like Ray Allen and uh, Allen Iverson. But just to even have a rookie, if you pulled a rookie, you got your money back on the box, which was which was pretty cool. Yeah, and I wasn't I wasn't involved in the hobby back then. Um, I was I had left uh, when I was. I don't know, 17 in, in 1993. So I, and I didn't come back till the, uh, probably early to mid 2000s. So I missed this frenzy. So I, I have to trust everything you say. And I, it's just, I Which is all the, true. What a, it's all, I believe you. <laughs> uh, you've never lied to me. No. Uh, but yeah, it's it, to see this, you know, this upward trend. Like I'm looking at Tim Duncan refractors. People are asking ten, fifteen thousand dollars for PSA 10 rookies. And um, I, I just, he's another guy. I feel like even though he played on one team because he was so quiet and so unassuming, his cards don't sell for what they should. Um, you know, people are asking, you can ask the world for a card, but some of his stuff, uh, I feel, is undervalued. Yeah. And I, I think he'll be appreciated down the road. Well, see, and it's really just the bottom stuff that needs, because his, uh, his, his, cards and autographs like he he didn't sign a lot in products so he's in some late 90s products and good luck for you know type in tim duncan auto and go try to get something for under 400 dollars. good luck um and uh but he he has i mean san antonio as far as collectors uh they love him they love david robinson they even love sean elliott <laughs> you know so he does have a sure. good he does have a good fan base and then you know but yeah it's like his game was very it, w- it wasn't um you know he would explode for a dunk here and there but he, he didn't have that explosive personality i guess that would match an explosive game so um right. you know so that's probably why but no his cards i mean i, th- I think you know his graded rookies and things like that are, are definitely you know they're up there they're, they're up there uh i would I, well i think because of maybe where he is in the the industry with the uh, with the refractors and everything, but like his base cards is you know nobody really goes and looks for Tim Duncan stuff. It's more oh give me Kobe, give me MJ. Yeah. So just his quiet personality, but still a great great player. So you brought up Kobe Bryant. What's going on? Uh, you know, as far as his uh, his career. Oh man. Uh, well, we know what's going on with him. Unfortunately, what a horrible tragedy. Um, just so sad. But to, to highlight what he did in the NBA, I mean, he was again. He was uh, one of those guys that came right out of uh, right out of high school. He was an 18-time All Star, 15-time All NBA, 12-time All Defensive Player, uh, MVP, two-time Final MVP, five-time World Champion. He comes from uh, a, lo- a long line of players. His dad played, and uh, his his mom. His mom's name is actually Patricia, uh, Pamela, excuse me, Pamela Cox. And her brother is Chubby Cox. We, we joke around about that name. Uh, he, he was a, a former basketball player as well. So on both sides of his family, uh, he was, you know, he's got um, pedigree. So I thought that was really interesting. He was a McDonald's All-American. Uh, actually, one of the funny things was he was so young when he signed his first contract. He was 17. He had to have his parents co-sign the contract because he wasn't even 18 yet, so he couldn't even sign a legal document. So th- that was uh, pretty interesting. And then he was also the first guard ever to play 20 years in the NBA, which is also pretty impressive. You think of all the players who played for many, many years, and he was the first guard ever to play in the NBA. So, I mean, he was drafted by Charlotte, and then he was uh, 
he was traded to the Lakers. So uh, he was drafted 13th. And I think there was just a little bit, I think people were still a little scared, a little skeptical of uh, high school players. So even though he, he had, you know, what looked like he was on a good trajectory for his potential, uh, for his NBA career, he was kind of passed over by a bunch of teams because, you know, he was a high school player and really he was kind of a, an unknown commodity. I think, I, I don't have this written down, but I, I feel like he, maybe he grew up in Italy. His dad played in Italy or something. Because I know he spoke uh, another language, if I'm not mistaken. No, that's correct. Yeah, I, Joe, I, Joe Jellybean Bryant. Um, yeah, he did. He definitely played overseas and uh, Kobe went yeah. to, he actually went to school over there and, and he spoke Italian. Yeah, okay. So I, I didn't have that written down, but I, I thought I remembered that. So he was just like a kind of an unknown commodity. Now, I mean, you know, you're talking 20, a little more than 20 years later, you know, people scout the globe. They'll go to, uh, you know, the middle of New Zealand to find somebody. But back then it was a little bit different. You know, again, unknown commodity. Okay, he played, what, uh, was he Lower Marion in uh, Pennsylvania or something? I, again, I didn't write that down, but I feel like that's Yeah, what he, I he was there, but also, I mean, I think the big thing – I don't. I don't think it was so much that he was overlooked, and you're you're 100 right. It was, it was a gamble because you know with Garnett, you know six ten, six eleven, you know he's probably going to be able to block shots and and you know go up against athletically, you know some guys who are not as athletic as him, and and at least you might have a guy that might be a ten and ten guy, uh, for for a long time. Um, but with Kobe. It, I don't know if it was so much him being unknown. People knew about him, but the problem was is the draft class was so loaded it, with guys with experience that were kind of already proven. So, yeah, it's easy to look back and say, well, you know, Kobe probably should have been – I mean, Allen Iverson was the number one pick, all right? So even if Kobe ended up in the top five – but, again, Marcus Camby was a beast. Ray Allen was coming out of UConn. Um, you had guys – Stefan Marbury was in the, in the draft class. Um, also – how about Sharif Abdurrahim, who averaged you know near twenty points a game for seven seasons with the Grizzlies? He he was their anchor. Um, there were guys that were okay, willing to take. God, just to take away. I, it's so funny. I, I'm looking this up now. So the the two players who were drafted right before him. Are you ready? Sure. Are you, are you sitting down? Yep. Todd Fuller <laughs> and Vitali Adapenko. Vitali was good. <laughs> Todd Fuller not so much. <laughs> But I think, oh but but I also think like Tony Delk went ahead of him too, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and you know you also had uh, a guy named Samaki Walker who was actually, you know, kind of I I don't want to put him as like Greg Oden, but like he he was he was sought after. Samaki Walker was a really good college ball player and and had the size right. that that Kobe wasn't. You're absolutely right. So, so I Absolutely. think it was kind of, I think it was, it was, it was just that combination. I think if the, if the draft class was the following year, I mean, and let's, let's just say he was still coming out of high school, he'd probably be in the top 10. And then even the following year after that, like a 99, 2000, he, he might, you know, again, being that he's just coming out of high school somehow magically, um, you know, he'd probably be <laughs> even, he'd probably be in the top five. So, um, yeah. you know, no, so, you're right. I'm looking at, I'm looking at the top six now and you can, I mean, Coming into that draft, Iverson, Camby, Abdul Rahim, Marbury, Ray Allen, Antoine Walker. Yeah, oh, I, mean, see, I forgot about, about Walker. Yeah, so about two Hall of Famers and four guys who had very, very good um, careers in the NBA. So, and then it gets a little sticky with Lorenz and Wright, who I believe passed away. Kerry Kittles, who was a good player. Yeah, I mean, you can't. Eric Dampier, who was a big man. Um, yeah, I mean, you really can't complain. And then even after that, I'm looking Steve Nash, Jermaine O'Neal, Peja Stojakovic. So, yeah, there were some good, good players in that draft. So, yeah, I wouldn't say overlooked, but, yeah, it was just – it was a, it was a stacked draft, which means it was a stacked uh, year for products in terms of the – and that was the first year for refractors, you said. Well, so it, it was – yeah, it was the first – well, no, it wasn't for the first – so um, it was – so for some reason <laughs> – the night it wasn't the first year because 93 94 tops finest they, they did have refractors and i think 93 94 they also had refractors for some reason the finest product 94 95 uh 95 96 they they uh they took it away and that would be garnett's rookie year they just didn't do it um they okay. did introduce the peel no peel you know that year yes. um so that was a little innovative 
And that was a big question, like, you know, oh my God, do I do I peel it or do I not peel? It looks so much better peeled, but I don't want to I don't want to ruin the integrity. And you yeah. know, I, I think even the price guy one they, of those. By the way. Yeah, I think even. Have you ever, have you ever peeled? What's that? Have you, have you ever peeled one of them? I, I would be too afraid. I, I have left all of my peels on. No, I have cards filled with. Yeah, I, I when it came to the finest stuff, no. But when it came to the uh, the mystery finest, the inserts, when when the card, you basically got a black card that had like a coating. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, oh, I would. Pe- oh, I peel the, the the crap out of those. Oh, it's funny. Um. Yeah. I so think- God. No, I'm sorry. I think I have some of those black. Cause I'm just too afraid to peel it. Yeah, no, yeah, and you had you kind of had to worry about the corners and stuff like that too. But then, yes. you know, as time went on, I'm sure if you look at PSA cards like that are nines and tens, um, over time there might you know there's a good chance that the the peel could actually even be like bubbling. But I got to tell you, if you got a situation where there's a finest card and there was a refractor and you pull that peel off the refractor, I mean, it's like the colors just explode off the card. So you know, you, you it may not be a situation where you want to start peeling your cards now, but you know, if you have an opportunity to buy one, I mean, just even if it's a baseball, 1997 finest baseball, uh, and you get a common and you just you reflect that thing in the light without the peel, it it definitely enhances the color without the peel for sure. Oh, I'll we'll have to try that. And yeah, you're right. I mean, Kobe, I mean, Kobe Bryant's death is one of those uh, moments where, you know, I feel like you just knew when you got the news, like exactly where you were. And I, that whole week I was like, I was not only was I extremely saddened, but I couldn't take my mind off. It felt like one of the slowest weeks I've ever gone through. And I kept saying to myself, I can't believe he's gone, you know? And if we did this podcast back then, I'd probably be crying. Cause I, you know, just, it's one of those, you know, he's just one of those guys that, you know, you just watched and yeah, I knew he was, you know, he could be shrewd and, 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 you know, as far as, uh, there was people that definitely didn't like him, but he, I nobody wants to see anybody go out like the way he did, and and especially with his daughter and with the with the other um, you know families that were on board. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, I mean that was that wasn't even the worst thing that happened in 2020. I mean, it, it, this year is like basically cursed. Um, you know, when you we heard about it, it's like, oh, what a horrible story, and you don't think you're going to hear worse. And then we get the the COVID thing. We're still. No, I I was just told I'm working from home until at least September. Uh, just it, it's just a crazy, crazy world, and you have to appreciate every day, every minute. Um, just just enjoy and and listen to our podcast because why not? Yeah, and thank and thank you for listening. And um, you know, and and if you haven't checked out the last dance yet, I mean, I I just finished everything up. Um, you know, I think on Monday. And, uh, you know, oh, my God, I, they keep putting out documentaries like that on, on anybody. Like, I feel like, you know, if they did something like, say, on Tony Gwynn or, uh, you know, they're they're going you know, to do a 30 for 30 on Sammy Sosa, which I think is long overdue. I think I think Sammy Sosa, when when Chicago, when they didn't invite him back for uh, like an all time Cubs reunion, like it was like four or five years ago, I was completely disgusted. I, I just, you know, I think when, you know, it was basically like when those guys got announced that they were cheaters, it was like just everybody just like jumped on the wagon of, I don't, I don't care what his side of the story is. I'm going to throw all his stuff in the trash. And have, listen, have we ever heard from Sammy Sosa? Like, I feel like other than, you know, these memes with him, like getting, you know, his skin tone changing, mm-hmm. I, you, you hear nothing from Sammy Sosa. Yeah, like, they have. Never, a- I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, we've never heard his side of the story. No. And you know, so I mean, and and you know what? And I and I think there's again, nostalgia. I think there's more people that are willing to forgive and recognize that I mean, I what was it 3 out of 4 years he had 60 home runs, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm just flying off the top of my head right now, but it's it sounds it's, about right. Yeah. It, but you got, it goes to show because in the in the, in the Hall of Fame voting, you're seeing, you know, as the older baseball writers disappear and the, the newer guys come, the guys who are probably around our age, and they saw this, and you'll see, you know, Clemens creeping up, Bonds creeping up. At some point, maybe 2021, maybe 2022, these guys have a real shot to get into the Hall of Fame. Mark McGuire became a, a batting coach. Like, people are forgiving people. A-Rod who just continually lied about it, who, you know, as a Yankee fan, I still like him and everything, 
but he turned his whole life around, and now he's this you know amazing broadcast. Everybody loves him. Everybody loves A Rod. Well, not everybody, but most people like A Rod, and it's just we're forgiving people. Maybe time is is helping, but also the fact that these people did give us wonderful memories. I'm never going to forget 1998. I, I I'll never forget 1994. When, uh, you know, the one year that the Montreal Expos had a chance to actually win the World Series. And, you know, we had the stoppage. And then nobody, if you remember the ballparks in 95 and 96, uh, when the Yankees won the World Series in 96, I mean, they were fans. Don't get me wrong, but it was different. And then all of a sudden, 1998 rolls around and the summer of 98, it's going to go down at like the summer of 69, where, you know, they had, you had the Mets and, um, and landing on the moon and all this stuff in, in Woodstock. 98, you know, really was that kind of year for our generation. Just watching McGuire and Sosa battle every day. ESPN would break into, you know, oh, Mark McGuire's up. You got to uh, uh, I don't care if I have to go to the bathroom. I'm watching Mark McGuire, uh, you know, because I'm not getting St. Louis Cardinal games. So I'm going to sit and watch Mark McGuire. And if I pee my pants, I pee my pants. That's how it was. It's That's funny exactly too, and, how and, was. and what gets overlooked about that season, that home run chase, is actually what happened in the playoffs. And the and the, you know, the Padres get in, and they face the Yankees, and they get beat by the. They, I think they got swept by the Yankees, but um, you know the, the Cubs made the playoffs for the first time in a long time, and a lot of it had to do with Sammy Sosa. And as a matter of fact, I think he got MVP for that season. Um, you know, over over McGuire, if I'm not mistaken. I, I don't remember. Yeah, so um, I'm probably wrong, but <laughs> anyway, so we're going a little long today, but uh, but you know we th- you know sincerely you know a sincere thank you to all the listeners out there, um, you know hopefully we were able to distract you again a little bit with you know this whole crazy time. Uh, if you like the show, please like, share, and comment below. Subscribe and definitely hit the notification bell so that you know when we're going to be coming on um, or when we upload a new video. I personally have. Uh, one of the things I actually didn't get a chance to say before was, is that I hit a, a, I bought a really nice deal and I'm going to create a a different segment on our YouTube channel, uh, called fresh catch. And basically it's, you know, all the deals I go out and I buy, I'm going to, you know, do a quick video of some of the nice things that, you know, I, I pulled out. Some things are going to be going up for auction. Some things are going for grading and coming back and maybe going up on auction. Some things that might hit my personal collection. You don't know. So you have to wait and see. And then also too, I just recently went out and picked up, I don't know, 16 to 17 cards that are investment cards for, for myself. And, you know, I'll be doing a a, a mail day on that. So uh, definitely hit the notification bell and then, you know, click on the links below to visit Mike's opening day break room and also uh, Cardcast on eBay. So you can check out and see what's going on in the auctions or the eBay store. And we are out of here.